All right, notice I put it R in, in friends so you guys can help me out. <laughs> I haven't done a run through this lecture. I, in fact, I was adding slides just half an hour ago. Uh, this is my seventh version of this. And uh, just, it could go on forever. But I just want to kind of get the high points of the early history of how the idea came to people to bring water to the Imperial Valley and the flurry of activity that got it going right at the turn of the century. A little bit about how Hoover Dam got built and the response to the, the geographic and geological opportunities and challenges that, that, uh, that we have here. So this is one of my favorite facts about the Imperial Valley. Where did all that dirt from the Grand Canyon end up? As you may know, Grand Canyon is about a mile deep. And if you, uh, if you go back to the bottom of the Grand Canyon, it's 4 billion years old, on the oldest of Earth. And so where did all that, that dirt go? Well, we all know it went here. It came here. Colorado River, over millions of years, carved out the Grand Canyon. And since we're at the tail end of the Grand Canyon, of the uh, Colorado River, right above the uh, Sea of Cortez in the Delta area, over millions of years, this dep depositions of alluvial silt and sand has been laid down right here. And that's why you can drill down five, six, seven thousand feet and not hit a rock. So this is our area, the Salton Sink, and this is more or less the present Salton Sea right here. Over eons of time, the Colorado River would fill this whole area, and we call that Lake Cahuilla. And you can see it is very extensive, all the way past Indio, and all the way down here to just north of Cerro Prieto, which is a volcanic uh, remnant down about 23 miles south of the border. Right about here, right here at this angle, is the, uh, what we would call that, the uh, boundary between flowing, the watershed from flowing north, and then from here flows south. So you can see the Colorado River flows north into this thing any time it overflows its ordinary channel. In the first decade, uh, Howe compares the geography of Imperial Valley to his left hand. He says, you want to understand the Imperial Valley? Face north with your left hand up like this, and you can see that's the Imperial Valley. The bowl of your hand is a Salton Sink, and the north end we have the Salton Sea. And your, your hand lines, your lifeline, are actually like the New River on the west and the Alamo River on the east. He says, look, the, uh, the palm of your hand here, the edge of the palm of your hand is like the, the course of the, New, of the Colorado River. It's always at risk of flowing over this way instead of flowing south into the Sea of Cortez. So I thought that was an interesting little way to illustrate the geography of Imperial Valley. There's a satellite photo, and this is uh, Lake Havasu up here, Parker Dam would be down here. And so come down the Colorado River, we have Poston on the Arizona side. Here we have Ripley and Blythe and Palo Verde. And we're coming down here, and then we're going to have Yuma area. Of course, this area, this little white, uh, grayish area, that's Mexicali. And this is all the Mexicali Valley. And so the Colorado River comes here. And that water, almost all of it is diverted into agricultural to the north. We still have, of course, the same geography, this area being a big sink. Just to orient you, Mount Signal is right about there, right on the edge of the irrigated land. Of course, you can see there's, this used to be the delta area, and it is pretty much bone dry. This uh, area here is called La Cienega de Santa Clara, and it's a man-made reservoir. This is the very salty water that comes out of the Welton Mohawk drain. That we, it used to go right back into the river, but that raised the salinity of the river too much, and it was unacceptable to Mexico that the river water that they got was salty. So instead, we dumped it out here in the desert and created a new uh, bird sanctuary. It's about 15,000 acres of bird sanctuary that's uh, kind of become vital for the Pacific Flyway. Okay, kind of nice, interesting picture here. Here's uh, San Diego Bay, and this is all San Diego, Tijuana. Up here is, um, of course, LA, it's way up here. It's all of LA. And we have the Colorado River Aqueduct brings water from Lake Havasu over to L.A. 
by the way, that's what is all that green right there? That's the uh, our very very famous algae bloom. And when that happens, there's a lot of oxygen sucked out of the of the water, and that's when the fish die because all the nutrients going into the uh, lake uh, feeds the algae bloom, and when the algae does bloom occurs, the fish die. So one of the first guys who really noticed that the Imperial Valley could be irrigated by gravity from the Colorado River was Dr. Oliver Wasencraft. And he was a medical doctor who was actually part of the convention in 1849 when, the, uh, when California statehood was being proposed. And he uh, had gone through there earlier and he says, I'm going to go check it out. So he had his own expedition in 1849, that same year to the Imperial Valley and saw the uh, opportunity to irrigate the land. And um, we think of him as being a wonderful guy, but just a few days ago, a friend of mine dug up some things that at the Constitutional Convention uh, in, uh, in California, and he said, yes, we want California to come in as a state with no slavery. He said, because we don't want any blacks in California. <laughs> now, he said this in public, I have it, I have the document. He said, we don't want them at all. No slavery here is required because uh, we're not going to have it. So he, he was a little bit of a megalomaniac too. He, when he passed through Texas, he stopped there and there was a big outbreak of cholera. And so he prescribed a few uh, treatments and he said, yes, I've cured cholera in Texas. <laughs> he was, uh, because of his role in the California Convention, he was appointed the Indian agent for the West. I wonder what kind of Indian agent he was. <laughs> But he was a very resourceful guy, and he, he went to the uh, legislature in California in 1859, and he actually got the California legislature to grant him rights to 1,600 square miles of our desert. 1,600 square miles. And they said, oh, only one condition, you've got to get the U.S. Congress to approve of this, too. So he went to U.S. Congress, and he actually had a bill floated that next year in 1860, but it was never, never uh, ruled on. And so after, during the Civil War, they forgot about him. And he kept at it until 1887 when he died. So he, his idea was to be in charge of the whole thing by himself, in charge of the entire Imperial Valley. And that didn't work out for him. Okay, we're going back to this slide about how Lake Coahuila covered up this whole area. Now, the Salton Sea right now, I think it's about 250 below sea level, the top of it. So at this time, this lake covered the area up to 40 feet above sea level. 40 feet above sea level. And if this is, I couldn't get this separate slide from the, from the Redlands Institute, but this shows that from AD 700 to the present day, the Salton Sea has, same area has filled in. Most of the time it was full. Most of the time it was full. So the last time they know it was full was in the, in the 1700s. You mean that whole section was full of water in the 1700s? Well, I don't know if the entire thing, I mean, because there was different amounts. You know, I wouldn't say the whole thing was full. That's, I, that seems to be what's indicated by this top line. So, because this is the way it has been since 1900. So, maybe, maybe that does mean the whole thing was full. So, the area from, from Blythe to here is pretty flat. The fall from Yuma is, I think it's only 130 feet above sea level in Yuma. So the fall is so slight, that's when you see rivers meander, when the fall is slow, uh, slight. When the river fall is steep, the river creates a very straight course. So yeah, that's why the, the river is meandering. Uh, sometimes I'm going to go this way, sometimes I'm going to go this way. Remember on the bridge of your hand here, so it came into the Imperial Valley and filled up our sink. Which, by the way, you remember that the uh, San Andreas Fault runs through here. So this side is the Pacific plate, and this side is the continental plate of the giant tectonic plate system on the Earth. So we have a spreading and moving upward Pacific plate with the uh, continental plate being stationary. So that's why this is opening up and sinking right there. So uh, Wasencraft, and there was a guy named Blake, William Blake, that was part of uh, the Williamson Expedition, which was a government. Uh, uh, directed expedition. He was a geologist, part of that expedition, and so we can still see this line up at Travertine Point on the way to Coachella that shows the old uh, high water mark and still.
killed every day, so you can see that. So, <coughs> Waz and Kraft saw that, Blake saw that, Blake submitted a report, and it's a very famous report from the 1853 expedition. I really love this photo. This is a photo from 1915. I got off the uh, Redlands Institute through the Coachella Valley Historical Society. Wonderful photo. Love the light and the dark. Well, before water, what was it like here? Well, we think of the desert on both sides of our valley, but remember, that wasn't the same as the desert in the middle. With a big bowl and you have water constantly evaporating, you're going to have the heavier soils on the edge and, and the lighter soils on the edge and the real heavy soils in the middle. The smaller part of I'm trying to say. So clay in the middle and sand on the edges. So we had with some very hard soil, uh, lots of little depressions, and uh, not the vegetation you're going to see on the desert so much, but whenever there was an overflow from the river, which happened quite a lot, even though it didn't fill the whole valley, there would be an overflow every year, and it would fill up part of the Mexicali Valley along the New River, the old Alamo River Channel. And there were a lot of little lakes. So by Calexico, there was a lake called Cameron Lake. And by uh, Seals B and out by Seely, there was a lake called Blue Lake. Then on to the west of uh, Imperial, there was a bunch of little depressions that they would fill up too. And so the earliest use of the Imperial Valley, uh, right before the uh, 1900s, was for cattle. So they would bring cattle from the mountains and they would run the cattle during the time of the year that the water was here. And there was plenty of pasture and then they, when it started to get warm, they would run the cattle back up, back uphill. Uh, maybe some of you know that the salt sea was, of course, dry. And it was because of over and over the salt salty water being uh, evaporated out. There was, it was actually mined through the Liverpool Salt Works with the company name in the bottom of the salt sea. So enter Charles Rockwood. Charles Robinson Rockwood was born in Flint, Michigan in 1860. And he went to, uh, he went to engineering school but he dropped out because he said he studied so much his eyes went bad. And then he was hired in Washington for the, by the Yakima Railroad for a while. And he, he began to develop his skills in, in surveying and engineering. And also there was some irrigation in the Yakima area. And then he was hired by a, an entrepreneur out of Denver, a guy named Beatty, to do the surveying <coughs> of, to see if they could actually irrigate the Sonoran side of the river. And so he came down and he had a whole party of people in 1892 including C.N. Perry, who you know from Calexico. I don't know, there's eight or ten guys, and they spent a few months surveying. He, he found that you could not irrigate the Sonoran side or the Arizona side, but he saw what could happen over here. Now, this is a picture from the first 30 years. They have a big picture of Rockwood, the first 30 years of a book, one of the key books about the history of Imperial Valley. It's a bound copy that my grandmother needed from 1931. So they have a lot about Charles Rockwood in there, including an article he wrote himself about what happened. And this, I, I, I've always seen this picture in there, and he looks sort of resigned to me, a little bit beaten, you know, like, oh well. And he, he was a kind of a hard luck Charlie guy. A lot of bad things happened to Charles Rockwood. In 1892, he, in 1893, he took his survey back to John Beatty in Denver. And only to find out that Beatty, who had raised about $175,000, he was offering this stock to bellboys and everybody he knew was buying stock in John Beatty's uh, scheme. But he blew all the money. In fact, he, he couldn't pay Rockwood. But Rockwood, they owed him $3,500 himself and also the crew. And so he never got paid. So he took this money, I mean, this debt, and he, and by the way, I. Beatty was a total fraud. He had an office in New York, and he had all these glass cases with, with actual fruit in there, dates and tangerines and grapefruit and all these things over in New Jersey, and a beautiful office and a skyscraper, and it was all fake. It was totally fake because, of course, nothing had ever been done, not even close. In fact, they hadn't even filed for any water yet in the Imperial Valley. So, so Beatty was a, quite a fraud. He even defrauded his own cousin, James Beatty, who put up, I think, $30,000. And so he lost his money, too. 
But I, I really like this picture. This is a picture in, uh, in the first decade book. And I just found this picture this morning. Uh, this book is now in the public domain. You can get it for free on Google Books. Now, this is uh, <coughs> Rockwood in uh, 1892. was only 32 years old. So I kind of want to rather picture him more as a young man full of energy and plans and dreams. And I just see this here. Look at him. He's got, uh, you know, he's a man with uh, ready, ready to go. And so much a much different guy here, you know. He's just sort of, I just like this photo a lot more. <laughs> well, Rockwood, he, he realized this is like big stuff. You know, I mean, the, if you could irrigate the entire Imperial Valley by gravity, 500,000 acres for sure, easy. On the Mexican side, on almost the same amount of money, a million acres of land, gravity fed. Wow, this is riches to be made. So Anthony Heber was from uh, Chicago, and they got together and they formed the California Development Company in 1896. So they formed the California Development Company in 1896. And they were pretty clever. If you look in the these books and it says, yes, the California Development Company was incorporated with a value of $1,250,000. So I, I read this over the years and I was scratching my head. You know, I really didn't, I'm not a good finance person, you know, I'm an English teacher. So I'm wondering, I'm wondering to get the money, you know, what's going on? And then I looked in another book and he said, what happened is that now Rockwood never got paid, right? So he says, all right, we have a new company. Now the new company owes me the money. I've never been paid $3,500, but I tell you what, I'll trade you this debt for one third of the stock. And actually, I think it was a million dollars. So they gave him $333,000 worth of stock for the debt that the company before owed him. In other words, there's no money. You know, they had all this stock at a par value of $100 each. But nobody gave him any money for that. It was just a number. So we have a California Development Company with almost no money. I think Heffernan, he put in some real money. I think like, I don't know, $35,000, $40,000, real money. But the rest of it was just, okay, for your goodwill and your labor and your dreams, we're going to assign you this stock at the par value of 100 bucks. But there's no money. So they, uh, remember, Rockwood has this, these surveys, and he has all the equipment from the surveys, and that's his value, because he holds that, and that's, he owns that. So he, he gave that to the company for the you know, $333,000 of stock. But he realized, well, the water has to go through Mexico. It's too costly to build an all-American canal through the sand dunes. It has to go through Mexico. So we have to, Mexico said, well, you've got to form a Mexican company if you're going to do business here. So they formed this company, Sociedad de Riegos de Terrenos de Baja California. Nobody could say that. <laughs> so they, you always see it just referred to as the Mexican company. So the CBC actually owned this company too. Uh, I, talk, I told you that uh, Rockwood was a hard luck guy. So in Mexico, the land was owned by a guy named Andrade. So we still have a little town called Andrade, General Andrade, Guillermo Andrade. And he owned the entire Mexicali Valley, basically. It was, I suppose it was a land grant. He was a well-cultured man. He studied in France and Spain. He was born in 1929, so he was an old guy already in 1900. He was an ambassador to the United States and for consulate or something in Los Angeles. So they had to get an option from him to, to, to buy his land, to run the canal through his land. But he didn't really care about that. He just was, it was a nuisance to him. Again, he was wealthy and well-established old. So he would dribble out these options to him, to people. He sold the options to these guys in Scotland. So Rockwood actually went to Scotland three times to try to, to buy the option for, for this land. The third time he actually he had, he wasn't to Scotland because those guys had already died. And see, he would get, get a deal almost done, the guy died. So then he goes back and he finds this uh, investment firm in London. And he said, okay, we like it. So that guy died. I mean, everything bad happened to Rockwood. And so then he, uh, then he interested Forbes. There was a guy named Forbes. I don't know if it's the same Forbes family as today, but he owned the Bell Telephone Company. 
he sent his old man out to do a report, a guy named Anderson. And Anderson came back and said, yeah, it's a good deal. And Forbes said, yeah, I don't think so. So it was at the moment of getting it done, and Forbes said, no, I don't think so. So over and over again, things didn't work out for, uh, for, uh, for Rockwood. In uh, 1898, he didn't have, there was no money at all. And he had to end up, he took a contract and worked in Puerto Rico for a while. Just to be alive. And he, uh, there's some passages where, and they had this incorporation, CDC was incorporated in New Jersey. I don't know why, but they couldn't even pay the filing fee, the yearly filing fee to keep the corporation alive, and it was way past due. And so Heber actually hawked his wife jewelry so that Rockwood could go back to New Jersey and get make a plea for more money from someone. I mean, these guys were dead broke. I need to read you a little passage from the, uh, the book here, the 30 years that um, Otis Talbot wrote. He was a newspaper man. And uh, Howe was a newspaper man too, and then Talbot took over the ID Press. And they both wrote books. So it says about Rockwood, it says, he followed every clue that looked like it led to money. He crossed the continent time and again, visited Europe, saw the bag of gold at the foot of the rainbow several times, only to have it dissipated into the mists by the breaking out of a war, the death of a principal, or the underhanded perfidy of a friend. He was deserted by friends and backers, laughed at as the father of a chimera by unyielding bankers east and west. In all of it, he hung on with a tenacious hope. So, uh, he talks about Rockwood in another section. Is everything bad happened Rockwood? So enter George Chafee. Again, CDC really is almost just a dream. There's no money. Chafee was six, 12 years older than Rockwood. He was born in 1848 in a province outside of Ontario, Canada. His father was in the steamship business on, on lakes. So he, he went to school until age 14 and he dropped out. But he studied on his own. He studied engineering books in the library. And he was also a seaman in his father's um, ships. And so he, uh, he designed his own ships. And he, numerous ships were designed that he actually uh, won uh, prizes for, he won races with. And so he was really already a very accomplished man, even at a young age. His parents moved to Riverside in 1879. And so he came out for a visit uh, that year or the next year. And he was just amazed by what was going on out west. He actually met Wozencraft, too. Wozencraft was living in San, in San Bernardino at that time. So he had talked to Wozencraft about this. And he thought, oh, nobody's going to live there. It's too hot. It's, just, it's not going to work. So forget it. But in, uh, him and his brother William, they met this guy, Garcia, who had a huge ranch. And Chafee uh, looked around and he said, you know what, I'll, give you, I'll buy this $1,000 ranch for 25 bucks a day. And uh, they felt good about it, they shook hands and they did. So what he did, he laid out the community of Etiwanda, a name of an Indian tribe in Ontario. Etiwanda, and so that, he started the town, which today is still there. And he came in and he know, uh, figured out that the upstream there, he could put in a hydroelectric plant to uh, to serve the city of Etiwanda. And he put a, uh, of course he electrified his house, he lived in the Garcia's house for a while, and he put a light bulb on the roof that could be seen from Riverside. I don't know, it's 30 miles away or something. <coughs> so this was the first hydroelectric plant, hydroelectric plant west of the Mississippi. It was around 1881, 1882. And he subdivided that 100,000 that acres into 10 acre lots, so he made a lot of money. Uh, the city of L.A. thought this was pretty impressive, so he laid out the electrical grid for the city of L.A. Next thing he did is he uh, started the town of Ontario. And it's real famous there because he named a straight line 250 feet wide or yards wide, I don't know, double wide and promenade of Euclid. Okay, that's a big town street in Ontario, perfectly straight, right? <coughs> and he wanted, to, he wanted to lay out this kind of utopian community in Ontario. And he did very well with that, he made money there. He also uh, created the town of Upland, California. So you can see that Chafee had a lot going for him. Uh, there was a contingent of people from Australia that came over and they heard about Etiwanda in Ontario. And one of the members of this contingent was a guy named Deacon. 
And so he says, man, what you guys are doing is incredible. You have all this irrigation. And he brought, when he brought the hydroelectric power, he also brought irrigation. And they had a lot of fruit trees, especially citrus. And so Deacon came over with his contingent from Australia and he said, why don't you come to Australia and help us? Which he did. He sold everything. And he moved to Australia with his brother. And they proceeded to transform uh, two areas of Australia. He lived there two years using the Murray River and the Darling River to create totally irrigated communities called Renmark and Mildura. He was there 11 years, a technical masterpiece. He invented a new pump called the Chafee Pump, and he became a member of the Royal Society of Engineers in London. He was just a totally self-made, important guy. And Deakin later became the Prime Minister of Australia, so they were buddies for life. <coughs> Deakin was a real champion for Chafee. But there were some problems there, too. I don't quite understand what happened, but uh, this was a technical masterpiece, but not very financially successful. So Chafee, there, was, there were some problems, and he was sort of pushed aside. And his brother stayed there as a rancher, but Chafee came back to California, and he was pretty much not very wealthy anymore. So he's back in 1897, 1898, he's back in California. And now that he's been in Australia, which is very hot, he thinks, well, People could live in Imperial Valley. Maybe, maybe this is a good idea after all. So Chafee came down and figured out that he could see what was going on in Rockwood and Heber were at the end of their ropes. They had no other alternative. Chafee drove a hard bargain. He said, I'm in control of the entire company for five years. I'm president. I'm the chief operating officer. I'm, I'm it. I'm the CDC now, and I will do this for five years. And I'll raise the money to do this. But, oh, first he went out and did his own survey, by the way. He, he did his own survey. He was out in, out in the country with an Indian guide for three weeks. And so then he came back and he created these new companies, Imperial Land Company, Delft Investment Company, and he came back with a mutual water company idea, which he had used in Etiwanda and Ontario. And the mutual water company is when you buy one share in the water company entitled to your one uh, the water for one acre of land. Uh, see if I can show you this. Did I put the survey in there? Okay, I wanted to make sure I can blow this up. You probably can't see it. No, no. Well, let me go back. You're not going to be able to see this very well, but here's. The Rockwood wanted to take water from way up here above Yuma, by the, where we have the Laguna Dam now, and then bring it down to the river. And then this is his survey through here. He was going to bring in a canal north. This is all Rockwood's plan. And so, according to Rockwood, this was going to take a million dollars to do it. So when Chafee went out and did his own survey, he found out, well, here's the old, here's the Alamo River where the natural overflow occurred during the floods. Every spring and summer, the water melted in Wyoming and, and Colorado, and the river flooded. So this was one of the natural channels. So he figured out, well, geez, all I need to do is start right here with a little cut, make a canal down to here, and I got 50 miles of a free ride over to here. And then this is Sharp's heading where they, they create canals going this way and this way and this way. So he did it for $100,000, not a million dollars. He put in this gate. So this is a very famous Chafee gate that was 70 feet wide, 15 feet high. So starting in May of 1901, water came into the Valley. And in June, only a, two or three weeks later, water reached the town of Calexico when they started growing crops. While he was doing the excavation, uh, they were already building canals. So I have that slide coming up. Okay, well, so here's the Alamo River Channel in Mexico. And uh, you can see by this, this actually goes into Mexico this is about 10 to 12 miles south of the border. It's a long way. So the city of Mexicali is right here. This is way south before it loops back around the sand dunes. See, the sand dunes are right here. Around the sand dunes and then back to the north. So this is how they made the canals. And there's this incredibly impressive amount of building going on in those times. Just in the first two years, they built 400 miles. 
another two or three hundred miles in the next couple of years. This huge tidal activity, I can't imagine the hubbub and the hum and the excitement of all the people that were flooding in the Imperial Valley to create this um, new system that we have today. And this was famous, this was world famous. Uh, we had, there was people come around, they had sort of looked like kind of a concentration camp, doesn't it? The guard tower, the journalists were all just camped out to see what was going on in the Valley with this uh, new, new era that was going to grow everything. I'm not sure the exact date of these photos. They were dated. These are all photos from the ID files that they shared with me. But uh, you can see that uh, very productive. Early days. We had issues. The Department of Agriculture issued a report in 1902 that said nothing's going to go out there to alkali. Now this is a very hurried report. They sampled very little parts of the valley, and so this report was very damning to the uh, to the colonizing. But what about credit? Could you get credit? And you got somebody was reading a report that said nothing's going to grow out here. No. The other huge problem that we had was that. Uh, Congress said, no, this is still a navigable river. Can't put any dams on it. Can't take the water for irrigation. We haven't decided yet how we're going to use this river yet. And you get credit if the government says you can't use the water for irrigation. There's not going to be any dams on this river. We're going to have boats going up and down it. But it was funny because at the same time, they were planning on building the Laguna Dam. So one part of the federal government says, yeah, I'm not going to out there. And uh, yeah, we're going to run boats up and down it, but uh, we're going to build a dam here too, just in case. The Luna Dam was authorized, I think, in 1904, and they started working on it in 1905. The Luna Dam was just above uh, Yuma. There was some problems locally. They were, you know, they had 14 water districts. The service was not very consistent. It was body. Sometimes farmers couldn't get water. They said, you know, we need new leadership, we need a better program. We don't want to pay for water, we want it free. Let the government come in and take care of all this for us. And so there was actually a contingent of local farmers and citizens that were wanting to get the Bureau of Reclamation to take over. Just to back up a little bit, in, uh, starting in 1896, there were guys, this was a system that just blows my mind. This was common in many places. You walk up to the river, you get your post, you hammer your post on the river, and then on the side of it you staple, well they didn't have staples, right? So they had to nail on a little paper that says, I hereby claim 10,000 cubic feet per second of this river. <laughs> and then you walk, go over to San Diego to the county recorder office and say, here, I want to record this claim that I have right to 10,000 cubic feet per second of this river. And so, there was a guy named Gonder and Heffernan and these various guys. They think that's a pretty good idea. Walk up to the riverside, put their post in, go to San Diego. I claim 10,000 cubic feet per second of this river. Well, the book written by Mike Dowd has a list of 18 guys who all claim 10,000 cubic feet per second on the river. Now, that's 180,000 cubic feet per second, right? Now, think of a cubic foot per second as a basketball. Basketball is more or less a cubic foot. So think about 10,000 cubic basketballs going by every second. That's a lot of water, right? Well, I just checked on yesterday's flow in the Colorado River off of uh, Lake Mead was uh, 14,000 uh, cubic feet per second. Now, it can flow up to 100,000 and during flood time it has. In fact, 90,000 went through, way it came in the river about but there wasn't 180,000 cubic feet per second ever, ever. But those guys had claim to it under California law, and that really started, that really was established the private property rights to water in the Imperial Valley right there. And even to this day, they have the increased, uh, the axiom, first in time, first in line. So those are the first people to file on that water, and to this day, they still have number two priority on that water after Thomas Blythe. Thomas Blythe put his post on the side of the river in 1887. So 
but he was the number one guy that thought of this idea, hey, I want some of this river for posting. And uh, he died a little bit after this. Okay. Well, actually, this goes a little too, too far here. I want to show you this. <coughs> I got, I'm still working on the order of my slides. So here was the, uh, here's the Chafee Gate right here. So here's the border, California and Mexico, Colorado River, and this side is Arizona. So Chafee put his gate right here. Now we're still in the United States, so Mexico says, can't say, well, that's our water. No, it's our water, and we're delivering it to you right here. So the California Development Company gave the water to the Mexican company right here. Now the Mexican company has it for the rest of the time, and then they sell it to the mutual water company. But the Chafee Gate, being as how it was just temporary gates made of wood, and the, the soil is really bad, it's a, kind of like quicksand right here, they couldn't put it very low. They couldn't put it low enough. The river right here is, is 105 feet above sea level. The Chafee Gate, the bottom of it was 100 feet below sea level. Above sea level. So there's only a five foot difference between the top of the river and the bottom of the gate. Which means there's not enough fall to make sure the river can pass through there during low river times. See, because the river goes up and down, right? Summer and winter. Winter times when the river is really low because the water's all frozen. So the other problem is this water is full of silt. One third pound per cubic foot of water, dirt. It was. So every year this would silt up. Right away we had problems with deliveries. So they, uh, just in the second year they, uh, they cut a, they call it a bypass, right? So there, there's a gate right here, but they cut a bypass. There's no gate. Water's not flowing. Hey, we don't have any water for our cantaloupes. We don't have any water. What are we going to do? We don't have any water for the lettuce or whatever. So cut the gate, give them some water. So that was 1902. Uh, actually, there was another one here too. So in 1903, they decided to cut a gate here, an intake here, a big one. That was a sandbar. So in uh, 1904, there was these unexpected floods, and this kept widening, widening, widening. And they thought, okay, we better uh, close that down. So they, what they tried to do is they would. They would uh, hammer piles in. Let me see if I go back here again. Well, let's go back to the flood. You can see when it did flood, this is what happened. So the river started coming into the Imperial Valley instead of going into the Sea of Cortez. The whole river, little by little, came into the Imperial Valley. So this just flooded out Calexico and Mexicali. Calexico, this huge wearing away of the soil. And then we had this cutback phenomenon where the water was cutting back. And the actual uh, main canal going north, and then the Alamo Canal dropped like uh, another 20 feet. And so F.W. Hull was able to put a power plant going from the canal, the main canal, into the Alamo. And he was able to like double his output after the flood. Okay, this is actually the Alamo wastegate. So during the flood, they, were, they would divert the water into the new river. So most of the damage was done in the new river because the extra water was going into the new river, and then the agricultural water was still going into the canal. So here's a more modern picture of that area. This is Pilot Knob. Here's the, here's the big Q, Catch On Casino right here. And this is the All-American Canal. And this was the... Uh, the old Colorado River Channel was right here. That white line is really the boundary between Mexico and Arizona. So this is an interesting thing here. The, uh, that's where the water from the American Canal goes into Mexico. Right there, and there's Morelos Dam, and then the water comes into Mexico. So down about here was where the, the canal was. To, oh, here it is, the Alamo right here. That's the old channel. So you can see the, and then there's Yuma over here. Hey, Joe. Hi. I was just told the other day that the Rockwood Gate, which was put in 
1910, I think. It's still there, and the water goes through it the other way. Before the water went through it um, this way, now the water goes through it, so it's still there. So anyway, here's this mess where they had a chafing gate up here, and then down here was where the, all the water was going through into the Imperial Valley. They tried it several times to stop it, so here was one, here was one, I think I have a better slide on that. Here's a, during the flood time, this was the Colorado River Channel. Dry as bones. There's a car driving in there. Where the Colorado River was supposed to be, nothing. The entire flow of the Colorado River was coming into the Imperial Valley, and filling up the Salton Sea. Full of water. This is actually a later slide from a levee, but it gives you the idea. Railroad tracks were flooded. What happened to the salt works? Flooded. The railroad had to be moved three times. It kept getting flooded. You can see it. So Southern Pacific was pretty concerned about this. That was a railroad through the Imperial Valley. Happy times up at the Salton Sea. The house is now just a boat dock. But just a little over 100 years before that, it's the 1700s, there was water there anyway. Yeah. That's right. Do I have that twice? So then this is, the way they would try to fix it is they would put these piles in there, and some of these are 60 feet long sometimes. They put them two, a row, two of them, and then they drop mats of brush wired together with with barbed wire, and then they dropped bags of dirt. That was their first attempt. It didn't work. So they tried this two or three times, and uh, Rockwood wanted to put a, a, a levee here, like a, a jetty coming out here to push the water over on this side of the island. It didn't work. Then they started to build the Rockwood Gate here. They abandoned that and tried to do this here. But as they got closer and closer, of course, the water was going faster and faster, and it washed away the island gave that up. So they tried several times to do this. This is the Rockwood Gate, which was in the middle of the river, and this was raising up. See, it just flowed away. It just flowed away. So finally, they got the idea that they had to build a train trestle across this thing, and, have to, and build a train right across it and make a dump rock in. And what they want to do is just dump rock faster than the river could take it away. Now they failed so many times. They tried, I got, I count nine times they tried. So in October of, of 1906, they had, uh, that was when the gate lifted up and floated downstream. Okay. November the 4th, the river was all back in the channel. I think I have a picture of that. Actually, it's in the wrong place. Yeah. So the night, eight, not, November 4th, they had this rail line across here that was all plugged up. But then just uh, you know, three weeks later, a month later, wiped out the end of the uh, left came across here and back all the whole river into the Imperial Valley. So these are some amazing pictures of all the damage. So they got, Rockwood said, okay, I think I, I'm out. And I think the Southern Pacific came in and said, you're out. We're going to bring H.T. Corey in, and uh, the uh, Southern Pacific Railroad assumed the entire problem because the uh, California Development Company just had, didn't have any assets. They couldn't do it. Remember, the entire river is coming in the Imperial Valley. At some point, it's 90,000 cubic feet per second. It's a huge flow. What's going to happen? The entire Imperial Valley is going to be filled up again, just like it was. It's going to wipe out the entire project. Nothing will be left. So H.T. Corey was an engineer who was also very famous. He had been a professor at Missouri. He had a, he had a degree in engineering, master's in civil engineering, master's in mechanical engineering. He, had, uh, he uh, was famous. He wired cities, mansions. So he, uh, he had a pedigree also as an engineer. He worked for the Southern <coughs> Pacific. So they sent him here, and he said, OK, let's take care of this. So they got all the rock train carrying cars for the entire west of the United States. They basically shut down the Tucson and the LA Railroad system.
for about four weeks. They got rock from 200 miles away. They had like a thousand rail cars, and they were just pouring rock in there as fast as they could. <coughs> this is actually, I'm not sure if this is from the flood or later the levee damage. Their floods kept happening until uh, the All-American Canal was built. So I would point out that most of the workers were Native Americans. The Kukupa Indians were the ones doing the work. They didn't live too well. So this is when Cord came in and he had, he had two trestles side by side across this whole expanse. And so they brought in these side rock cars and they'd drop the rock in and move them out and bring in the next group. Now this is actually from later. The Imperial Irrigation District wasn't formed until 1911. But in order to keep the river out of the Imperial Valley, they had to build hundreds of miles of levees all through that valley. And they had rail lines across the top of them. And so that was the irrigation, Imperial Irrigation District's first job was to keep the water out until the Canal was built, well, until Hoover Dam was built in 1930. And so we think this is H.T. Corey right here. Eats Randolph was the assistant to uh, Harriman who ran the uh, uh, Southern Pacific. I showed you that slide. So here it is, getting getting it done. Right? This whole thing is filled. And I forgot to mention that underneath this, there's a hundred feet wide straw mat. I mean, a uh, brush mat. And this time they have three quarter inch wire cables. Well, on cross pieces are three uh, three eighths inch wire cables. So they put those down on both sides, a hundred feet wide. Uh, so they had to put those down with piles on that. And it's just incredible. It just was massive. They spent about two and a half million dollars in, in the course of a few weeks to get this done. Now, uh, this was finally closed up February 7, 1907. So we had all, basically all of uh, 1905 and all of 1906 with water running in the Imperial Valley. Now, this was the this was Rockwood Gate. Uh, that was put in in 1910. So this is the Colorado River Channel going south. And this is the water going into the uh, Alamo River, Alamo Canal, heading to the Imperial Valley in this way. And so this picture is actually 1934. So this was kept into uh, existence until all the way up until 1940 when the, the All-American Canal came into full service. That's like a Rockwood Gate in there. So that finally the river's under control. Again, that's the Rockwood Gate, and that's the water going in Mexico. See the dredges, dredgers, keeping this clear of silt, so it, would, uh, it doesn't plug up again. This picture isn't too old, but this is the Morelos Dam, and this is the Colorado River Channel going south toward the Sea of Cortez. Today, there's no water in here, and this is all overgrown. And this is the entry gate for the canal system into Mexico. So that's that's right here. Today is the water going into the canal system into Mexico. Now this is uh, Phil Swing. I don't have a whole lot on him. We're almost out of time, but Phil Swing is really the key guy in this whole picture after the first disaster. Phil Swing was from Riverside. He went to UC Berkeley. I'm pretty sure. His brother was a lawyer, and he became a lawyer. So he couldn't be a lawyer in the same town as a brother. So he came to Imperial Valley and started up as a lawyer in Imperial Valley. I think in the early teens. He was a very smart guy. He was quite dapper and handsome. Right away, he distinguished himself, and he became a superior court judge. Then he became the legal counsel to the Imperial Irrigation District. And then he was elected congressman. To, I forget the number of the district, but I think it was District 7. He was elected to Congress. Now, how does a guy from El Centro get elected to Congress? His district covered from here to Bishop and everything south of L.A. So that included San Diego County, San Bernardino County, Riverside County, Tulare County, Inyo County. The seven counties were in that district. Phil Swing got elected. What was his mission? Hoover Dam. That was his mission. As soon as we had that problem in 1904 to 1907, they said, we got to dam the river. We're going to we're gonna have this problem forever. So 
uh, Phil Swing wrote and Phil of uh, the Swing Johnson bill. Hiram Johnson was a Democrat and he was the governor of California and later became a senator from California. He was, he was a Democrat and Phil Swing was a Republican. So together they wrote the Swing Johnson bill to fund the building of Hoover Dam and the building of the All American Canal. So he had to put this through Congress three times before it was passed in the late 1920s. Now Hoover was president, right? But Hoover was against it. And Hoover was actually, he headed up the Colorado Commission. When they divided up the Colorado River between the upper basin states and the lower basin states in 1922, Hoover was, he led that commission. But he was against the Hoover Dam because he didn't want the government involved. He wanted the farmers themselves to pay for Hoover Dam. He wanted a low dam just for irrigation. He wanted the farmers to pay for it. But a lot of other people wanted a high dam that would be also have electrical power. And so those folks won. And, and we have, so he, he, enabling legislation in 1928, wrote, I think it was $150 million, $142 million to pay for the Hoover Dam and the All-American Canal. So this was the All-American Canal being built. There's All-American Canal. Phil Swing in 1942, when the, when the uh, All-American Canal was finally officially dedicated. I don't see them. This is a Leo Hetzel photo of Black Canyon. So people think of it as Boulder Canyon, but Hoover Dam was actually built in Black Canyon. So Leo Hetzel is a famous local photographer, and he took this picture. Here's the, I love this photographic transition because There's that same formation again. The Hoover Dam was built right there, 600 feet high of concrete and power plants. Here's the, uh, from the spillways, these are the tunnels they built to, uh, to dewater, to, to, to dry up the river. 50 foot diameter tunnels. There's another two over here. And they built Hoover Dam from 31, I think, till 35. Came on that. Great photo. These are the intake towers. So this is the upstream side. And there's a boat right here. People walking around. Incredibly impressive uh, structure. So anyway, that's my uh, lecture. And if you have any questions, we got a few minutes or comments. I we have John Polich in the audience. He's a big authority on Mr. Chafee. Anybody else have any comments or questions? How many miles are, are there of farm canals? Uh, I don't know, two or three thousand, I think. I think a couple, three thousand miles to go home to found all, all the laterals and drain and count them down. Phil, do you know that question? Right. How many miles of total canals are there in Imperial Valley? I think 1,500. Oh, 1,500 miles? Okay. So if you look at the history, it was nature, natural, that the water was kept coming here off and on over the years. That's right. And it wasn't until man-made stuff came that it kept the water away from this valley. That's right. I might wait, make one comment on, on, a, on the silt. The Gila was the source of much, most of the silt. Okay. And the reason for that was the Texans had moved their cattle in without any regard to the land and overgrazed it terribly. And that sent the silt down, and that's one of the reasons why all the engineers were off somewhat because they were looking at the historic rise of the river, historic changes of the river, and this had thrown all of the historic changes off. Just, and, just to back up a little bit, John, to let them know this is the Gila River coming in here. Yeah, so they, there's the Colorado, and the Gila River comes, and the Salt River feeds that too, right? way up to the east side of uh, Arizona. So you can say again that so the cattlemen overgrazed? Overgrazed that uh, valley area and uh, so all of that uh, silt came down down the Gila. And that also raised the flood. And that raised the flood. Because of and, erosion. Right? And uh, it made the natural shift, speeded up that natural shift to send the water to the valley. Okay. And so is the clay? Originally from the Grand Canyon over thousands of years? Well, the clay and the Gila. 
So both these, this is a river source here, and this too. And plus, there's all kinds of tributaries coming into the Colorado up, up north, in Utah and Wyoming and in Colorado. Yeah. But originally, there, I mean, like, if you go back way thousands of years, it was something different underneath the flood. Right. Like yeah. the sand and soil or something? Well, this was, uh, now remember, this has opened up. See, this, this was south. This was, at one time, there was no water here because, because of the plate shifting moving forward and out like that. If you look at uh, the big map of the California, the Baja California Peninsula, you can see that it tucks in very nicely down at uh, Acapulco. And so that's moved up and out like that over, I'm not sure how many millions of years, but that's why this is, this is kind of a spreading, this is the boundary, plate tectonic boundary. So this is a spreading area. And that's, that's sunk, and then the, the silt and the, uh, the the earth from the Grand Canyon has to fill it up. Yeah. Again, this flows north here. I want to ask you a quick question then on that. Sure. So, um, so was the silt calculation on the Colorado made below the Gila? Because it's my understanding that like the silt works in Imperial Dam are actually much larger than they need to be because they, they, they thought there was going to be a lot more silt than there has actually been coming down that. Is it because the original silt uh, amounts were calculated below uh, the well, uh, below the Gila as opposed to above it? The, the Gila wasn't bringing in that much silt historically. But uh, when that overgrazing occurred, it really wiped out the valley. Okay. And, uh, so that uh, it suddenly became a greater silt producer than the Colorado itself. So that was, uh, uh, as far as I know, that was the key thing in throwing all the engineering off. Well, I think his question is, is here's the silting, desilting area of Imperial Dam. So here's Imperial Dam, and the water comes through here and then goes to uh, American Canal. So this is a way that they continue to keep silt out of the All-American Canal by slowing it down, letting the silt drop out, and then they, they dredge this out to, uh, see this is, a, this is the same year, but this is now going to be dredged out, um, dug out, and actually take the silt out of the river. So the All-American Canal was kept clean of silt. So he's saying did they, did they over-engineered these because we didn't really have the silt problem. Like, part of that question is, yeah. we don't have so much of a silt problem because of the dams, because yeah. of the Lane Canyon and Hoover Dam. What do you do with the silt now? I don't know. I think it's just dump it nearby. I don't know what they do. The river. Pardon me? It dumps back into the river. They sluice it at Little Laguna, right? That's right. It dumps back into Laguna Dam. When was the All-American Canal built? It was started in 35, I think, and then finished around 40. Or maybe before that, I'm not exactly sure. I was hoping that somebody from the Pioneer Museum would be here. Yeah. What's a good source for that Phil Swing? Is there a one other connection? Yeah, there. it's called Phil Swing, and in fact, it's one of my references Phil Swing and Boulder Dam by Beverly Moeller Bowen. I can lend it to you. I got it on. You did a lot of history look into the past, what do you think is the future of the salt and sea? You can't look into the past without speculating on its future. I don't feel you know, much. No, there's a, well, it's just whatever the money is available. It's a lot of money to keep it alive, and I just doesn't look like the money is going to be available. They're going to try to keep as much of it watered through various schemes of keeping some water on it. That's the key thing. Try to, Prevent it from receding, so there's a lot of exposed playa, and so there's. Some, in fact, there had, they had a renewable energy conference just last week over at the uh, over at the uh, Marble River Country Club, and they uh, they talk about some like, ideas for solar ponds and things like that. I don't know. I, I don't. I'm not very positive and optimistic about it. <laughs> David's behind you, shaking his head. Shaking his head, yes or no? No. no. <laughs> You might ask Bill DeBois, he's been, uh, he's been on this subject for 60, 70 years, I think. I've forgotten all I knew. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you, Bill. I, I, I had to do a lot of studying to remember what I knew, too. 
because I've been there for 20 years, over 20 years now, and there's been so many studies, I'm kind of going to study it to death. I mean, with, how many times do you have to reinvent the wheel and not roll around? I agree with you. But there's a very healthy salt sea authority that's uh, got a lot of ideas. And I got some things from a guy from the Redlands Institute that you see uh, at the University of Redlands. Very passionate about saving the salt and sea. And they, there's so much data available. I don't know what's going to I happen. just don't want to see it end up like that other place. The, you know, Owens Always Island. late. Yeah. 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 If I had to make a prediction, I would say nothing will be done on the salt and sea. You'll just get dry up. Like you say, uh, in so many studies. So they talk about different set levels of salinity. Some parts of the sea would be really, really saline. These are all different uh, scenarios, different alternatives. But I have seen the concentric green idea. I don't know where that is. Most of you just go find. Dikes with cascading reservoirs. So, hydrogen. 
anchor saline in the middle, and then the other parts are a lot less. Are you still going to do that? They'll cut the C off of the two-thirds bottom and one-third top, north top, that would be able to be used as for people and stuff, and let all the bottom stuff just... just and that's what I heard was the most favored plan. Yeah. So you can drive across the other side. Okay. Yeah, dike it all the way across it, make the northern half still for recreation, and the southern half, like, you know, for a bird habitat. It's very, very shallow. That would be make some, some serpentining of wetlands in the south. That seems to be the most favorite alternative. And I've heard people say, oh yeah, we're in the south, we get the buddy. <laughs> yeah. Of the Salton Sea. They get the nice in the north, where my uncle is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well thanks for coming, I appreciate it.